Okay, and in this video, what I'll be doing is I'll be discussing the other side of those two techniques of non-market valuation. This one referred to as revealed preference. In the previous section or previous video, I discussed the concept of stated preference. And the whole goal of stated preference is that when you have em environmental amenities which have non-market value, we still want to understand how much society values these environmental amenities. And we make the assumption that environmental amenities have both a consumptive value and a non-consumptive value, or what we call use value and non-use value. And if we're going to get a true accurate picture of what we should say pay for environmental protection, then we need to have an accurate picture of how much people value environmental amenities. Stated preference is asking people a series of questions through contingent valuation surveying and eliciting willingness to pay and willingness to accept values that we believe or assume to be close to the true values people have for environmental amenities. Of course, there are various biases that we're concerned about in the context of contingent valuation surveys. Contingent valuation surveys have to be constructed very precisely and with very many things to consider, so to reduce those biases we previously mentioned. And then one perhaps big weakness of stated preference is that they are not looking at, say, observable data. They are asking people to state their particular feelings which is different than, say, looking at observed data and then drawing conclusions about values in that way. That's what we're referring to as revealed preference. Revealed preference methods of non-market valuation attempt to use existing data or to create data as a means to show how consumers reveal their preferences for environmental amenities as opposed to stating their preference for environmental amenities. So let's see what we mean by this. As we previously discussed, the largest problem with stated preference are the biases that form when you ask people questions about the elicitation of their willingness to pay for environmental amenity. Now this is what revealed preference is better at. Revealed preference seeks to elicit social value from environmental amenities and protection by observing market behavior in markets with direct impacts from environmental protection or a lack thereof. Under stated preference methods of non-market valuation, we simply ask individuals to tell us to state their preference for environmental amenities. Under revealed preference methods, instead we attempt to observe individual preferences for environmental amenities by looking at their consumptive decisions. While there are many types of revealed preference methods, there are three important types that we will discuss in this video. The first is a travel cost method. In the travel cost method, which seems very similar to the contingent valuation method, we ask individuals who are visiting, say, perhaps a park, various questions about how much they paid to visit that particular park. So, for example, if I were to ask individuals visiting Acadian, Acadian National Park, these are the questions I might ask them. How many miles did it take you to get here? Did you drive, fly, or take a boat to get here? How many days are you staying? Are you staying in a hotel or are you staying in a campsite? How many days of work, unpaid, did you give up in order to take this trip? So on and so forth. As you can see by this line of questioning, what we're attempting to do is ask someone, basically, how much did you pay to visit Acadia National Park? In other words, what was your revealed willingness to pay for this particular environmental amenity, with the idea being that if someone visits a park and expends money in order to visit it, this must mean that their value of that park is at least equal to what they were willing to pay to visit it, right? They're revealing their preference to maintain the environmental amenity by visiting it and enjoying it. And this is the big argument that we have for the national park system in the U.S is that people are willing to visit them. People are willing to, at times, pay large amounts of money, both in terms of getting into the parks as well as staying at or near the parks themselves. Therefore, it's clearly the case that we have monetary quantifiable value for environmental amenities. If people didn't have quantifiable monetary value for environmental amenities, then they wouldn't spend money to get to them. And so what the travel cost method attempts to do is essentially take the spirit of a contingent valuation survey and instead ask questions directly related to actual economic behavior. 
So the travel cost method attempts to elicit willingness to pay by actually observing willingness to pay. So in our previous example, let's suppose that we have these answers to those questions. And let's suppose that we had 3 million visitors to Acadia over that time period. What this actually allows us to do is kind of come up with, for a given year, the true social value for Acadia National Park. And if we use this particular data and we update it, we can see that, according to our calculations, that Acadia National Park is worth around $3.3 billion annually to individuals visiting the park each year. The travel cost method explicitly relies upon the idea that there is both market value and non-market value for the environmental amenity. However, because we can't measure non-market value, in other words, when I visit Acadia National Park, there's no way of me knowing exactly how much someone is enjoying themselves, right? We could perhaps couple a travel cost method survey with a contingent valuation survey, right? That's actually something that researchers often do. And this allows us perhaps to get at some of the non-consumptive uh, value. But it's important for us to point out that the travel cost method explicitly relies upon a preference revelation about market value for environmental amenities. How much gas are you willing to consume in order to get to a particular park tells us at least in part what you're willing to pay in order to maintain that particular environmental amenity. Perhaps a controversial version of revealed preference is a so-called valuation of a statistical life. Oftentimes humans undertake individual effort to reduce their own mortality risk. For example, we may vote into law particular cigarette taxes, which necessarily increase the cost of cigarettes, but reduce the chances that cigarettes kill individuals. And so in a sense, if we see how much someone's willing to pay to reduce their own mortality risk, say from a social perspective, then we have an idea of how much we actually value human lives. Here's a good environmental example. We've known for a long time that one particular hazard inside homes is radon contamination, radon pollution inside of homes. Now, individuals can purchase their own radon detector, detectors. That way they know if they have a radon problem inside their home. But, of course, not everyone buys them. And radon detectors only reduce the chances that you die from radon poisoning by a very small amount, although radon detectors are themselves not very expensive also. But it is necessarily true that if I buy a radon detector, I reduce my chances of dying from radon poisoning by an amount. That's a reduction in my mortality risk. And I spent money on the radon detector, therefore I've spent a certain amount of money to reduce my own mortality risk. The argument there could be that we then could take that willingness to pay to reduce mortality risk. We could consider what the actual change in mortality risk was, and that gives us an idea of how much I value my own life. And then, of course, we assume average uh, across populations, and then this allows us to make various statements about how much we value our lives relative to particular policy decisions. So here's an example. Consider that we put smoke detectors in our house, an act that reduces our chances of death by 0.01 to 0.00999. And let's suppose the smoke detector costs $20. Well, this is a reduction in our mortality of 0.0001, or excuse me, 0.00001, and the cost of the smoke detector itself was $20. So we do some simple calculations, and we can see that the VSL here is $2 million. What this means is that by paying $20 to reduce my mortality risk by that particular amount, I'm signaling to the market that I value my own life at $2 million. VSLs have been controversial because they've been used a lot, in fact. They're one of the most often used methods of environmental valuation by the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. The EPA has used VSLs for a long time in order to discuss how much we should reduce uh, particulate matter pollution, how much we should reduce CO2 uh, pollution, which of course don't have, doesn't have much uh, risk of, of, uh, on, on human mortality, which is one of the reasons why we have not reduced CO2 emissions much through EPA policy. Um, SO2 reduction um, required VSLs 
So the EPA is often used via cells as both an argument for particular levels of environmental protection as well as particular forms of environmental protection. As I mentioned, this is controversial because you can imagine that if we have a problem putting quantifiable values on trees, we're going to have a huge problem putting quantifiable values on human lives. And the EPA has come under fire for the use of VSLs. And in fact, in a paper you'll read called Euthanizing the VSL or Euthanizing the Valuation of a Statistical Life, the authors argue that there are so many problems with using VSLs for environmental policy that it's probably not the smartest thing to be using. Now here um, is a couple excerpts from the textbook which uh, show you relative to particular policies in the literature what the VSLs um, tend to be. Um, so we have um, particulate matter uh, pollution, we have lead pollution here, um, we have uh, particulate matter pollution and oxide pollution, we have particulate matter pollution and various other oxides such as SO2 and NO2. Um, and so we can see, uh, you know, in a sense, um, how much the relative change in mortality risk uh, leads to different valuations in terms of what we actually consider. So, for example, if we just look at sort of mortality as a whole, reducing particulate matter and lead um, would create very, very high VSLs um, because the actual change in mortality risk is fairly large um, relative to the cost of uh, reducing that particular uh, mortality. If you go back and you look at the VSL itself, notice that um, the larger the change in mortality, um, then the lower the VSL tends to be, uh, or the smaller the amount of money paid to reduce the mortality is, um, the smaller the VSL is. So if we're, say, spending a lot of money to reduce our mortality by very little, then of course we're going to have very big VSLs. On the other hand, if we're spending very little money to produce large changes in mortality, then our VSLs are not going to be as large. The weaknesses of VSLs are that they have wildly different values depending upon the numbers involved. Um, they assume that everyone understands mortality risk and bases their decision in part on such considerations. We know that, again, this is sort of an information problem. Some people don't necessarily understand various types of mortality risks, and therefore it's hard for us to generate sort of population averages in terms of how people react to different mortality risks. And plus there are obviously the moral implications of placing a dollar value on a human life and the ethical considerations that, that come into that. Um, VSLs have also at times been politically contentious in the past, you know, for these very same reasons. All right, and the last approach we'll talk about is the so-called hedonic pricing method. And the hedonic pricing method, what we use is a form of empirical research and data and regression analysis in order to understand perhaps the impact of slightly better environmental amenities in a particular area relative to an otherwise similar area. Um, for example, in this particular model that you're looking at here, this is a regression equation which says that the price um, that a, a house sells for um, is based on several factors. Uh, square footage, um, the crime rate in the neighborhood, the number of bathrooms in the house, um, as well as the air quality. Now the idea is, is that I, as the researcher, gather data on home prices and square footage and crime rates and bathrooms and, and as well as air quality on as many houses as I can. And then what I want to do is I want to compare homes that are similar to each other. In other words, homes which have similar square footage, have similar crime rates, and have similar numbers of bathrooms, for example, but they differ in terms of air quality. And so what I do is I estimate this model, and what I'm trying to uncover is essentially the relationship between air quality and home price. And so by comparing homes that are similar in all of these attributes, but differ relative to air quality, I can estimate how much people are willing to pay for cleaner air by so showing how much more they're willing to pay for a home in an area with clean air versus a home in an area with dirty air. So in this sense, what I'm attempting to do is I'm attempting to compute the difference in willingness to pay 
for a home in a clean air region and a home, a similar home with similar attributes in a less clean air region. Now, the benefits of Adonic pricing, of course, are that I'm not asking anybody questions. I'm actually looking at actual home prices. I'm not you know, causing any sort of ethical or political concerns by using this particular method. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, I'm able to use fairly sophisticated uh, statistical techniques um, as a means to get at some of these questions. Um, and this allows me to put forward um, a compelling argument that suggests that people are in fact willing to pay more for better environmental outcomes. Again, remember, the whole point of non-market valuation is we want to generate a demand curve for environmental amenities. In this particular model, what we're in fact trying to do is generate the demand curve for clean air by showing how much more people are willing to pay for a home in an area with clean air than they would be willing to pay for a home in an area with dirty air that has more pollution. What regression results are, are estimates of correlating relationships. So in other words, our expectation would be that as the air quality rises, the willingness to pay for the home is also going to rise, and therefore the home price will be higher. And so if you look at this, this is uh, an example of potential results coming from this regression model. And what we can see here is that the coefficient this beta 4, which is our coefficient of interest, this is positive. What that tells us is that when air quality goes up, it has a positive influence on the sale price of a home. Uh, and in fact, we can quantify in a very specific way um, that specific result um, as we show here. Um, I'm not going to get into the um, technicality, uh, technical side of regressions. Um, that requires its own class. Suffice it to say, though, that hedonic pricing is emerging as the most preferred form of non-market valuation because, again, it doesn't have to rely upon questions in the context of contingent valuation. It also doesn't uh, have to require sort of seemingly unethical or seemingly uh, and potentially immoral uses of, of BSL, and, and, and we're not trying to, say, quantify human life, right? So this is just asking um, how much people are willing to pay for cleaner air, and then using home data, and specifically home data, uh, using air quality data as a way to elicit, again, that revealed preference. Remember, hedonic pricing is what we call revealed preference. So we're not asking someone what, what they're willing to pay for clean air, we're actually looking at what people seemingly were willing to pay for clean air by seeing how much they were more willing to pay a higher price for a home that was in a higher air quality area. And hedonic pricing is very popular um, in uh, environmental economic research and will continue to be popular because it sort of falls in line with the broader empirical push that we've seen within economics over the last 30, 40 years. Um, economics used to be a discipline where 75% of all research was theoretical, 25% empirical. Now it's completely opposite, with empirical research making up more than 80% of all economic research these days, and theory being um, relegated to uh, you know, secondary sta status amongst economic research. And hedonic pricing is one of the more um, promising lines of empirical research Again, you have to remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with environmental valuation, which will then go on to inform policy. And the better the technique of non-market valuation, um, subsequently the better the policy is going to be. And hedonic pricing just seems to provide a particular avenue and roadmap for us to have a good valuation estimates in terms of what people are willing to pay for environmental amenities by specifically looking at what they have paid uh, for environmental amenities, um, and then B, by not relying upon potentially controversial techniques, which may cause people to feel um, uncertain about the, the, the particular valuation technique. And then third, uh, C, third or C, whichever I'm talking about here, um, it would also not have to rely upon um, potentially bias-inducing questions, asking pe people directly what they're willing to pay for environmental amenities.